Hello, how are you going? My name is Tech. If you're new here, welcome to Bootlosophy, my channel that reviews boots, dives into bootmakers, and generally looks at all things boot related. Today I'm looking at the Timberland Chucker Boot from the Redwood Falls series. Is it a chucker boot or is it really an ankle boot? <laughs> This is what Timberland calls a chucka boot. I bought this in Singapore, which is a country that loves Timberland as a fashion brand, and Timberland boots and clothing are the best sellers all year round. I can't actually remember what it was called, but it definitely was labeled as a chucka boot, and recent research seems to show me that it's part of the Redwood Falls range of outdoorsy short boots. That's one thing about Timberland. It is such a huge international boot company that its range is more like sports shoes like Nike or Adidas where designs change every season and what you bought a couple of years ago uh, just aren't made anymore because they're out of season or out of fashion. Sure they have some perennials like the iconic uh, yellow boot, I've reviewed it here if you want to watch that review, uh, and a few others like the original Earthkeeper boots. But as for the other boots they make, frustratingly they swing in and out of stock from time to time. They even seem to have different models for different geographic markets. For example, uh, I was in London a couple of years ago and I went into a big Timberland store there looking for something um, that was similar to these boots. No, it didn't exist. Timberland is a big internationally selling company and as such, they make their boots in a variety of different countries, uh, practically in every continent in the world. As a large international company, it makes sense that their customer feedback systems tell them what's popular in uh, whichever market and so their sales and production teams will react accordingly. Looking at the various websites, yes, they have one website for each country. Uh, I can't really find a similar pair, although I do see similarities with other boots that they have on the Singapore website uh, that are referred to as Redwood Falls boots uh, of one model or another in that range. Uh, and they come in mock toe as well as plain toe versions. And just to complicate things further, Redwood Falls boots on the Australian and US websites are something different altogether. Anyway, it's a moving feast, so if anyone recognises this model and actually knows what it's called, put something in the comments below. Put me out of my misery. Maybe even put a link to a website. But one thing I'm sure of, Timberland do call this a chucker boot. There are other boots on their various websites that are chucker boots of a similar height with uh, four or five eye eyelets. Uh, to many people, though, this is not a chucker boot. To most people, a chucka boot is ankle high, uh, a short ankle high, and there's only two or three eyelets, and that seems to be the main point of definition, the number of eyelets. There are some myths about the history of the chucka boot, but from what I can gather, they originated in India in the late 19th, early 20th century, uniquely amongst polo players who wore them after a game of polo when they changed out of riding boots into something more comfortable to have their gin and tonics or a cup of tea. They became popular in the 1940s when the uh, British officers in the North African campaign uh, saw their Indian army cousins wearing these in the Cairo lounges and thought that they would be great for the desert war because they were a darn sight more comfortable in the hot sand than standard British army issue thick service boots. They started getting them made in the Cairo bazaars but modified the design by using crepe uh, rubber soles uh, for comfort and the ability to creep silently in night battles. They used suede so they were easy to look after and used a stitch down design from their South African colleagues' uh, Veldshaw and construction boots. Nathan Clark, who served in North Africa as a soldier, saw his officers wearing these boots and took one home to his family shoemaking company, which started to produce them for casual wear in the late 1940s, more so the 1950s after the war. And so the Clark's Desert Boot was born. The design really took off in the 1960s when mods wore them in England and it was picked up in Hollywood by celebrities like Steve McQueen. While all desert boots are chuckers, not all chuckers are desert boots. If you really want to be nerdy, you can quote that chucker boots look like desert boots but traditionally have a thin leather sole and have a more formal structure than desert boots, which are usually unstructured and have basically only two pieces of leather, the vamp and both quarters as one piece. At any rate, these Timberland boots uh, fail as chucker boots 
primarily because it has, uh, it's largely agreed that chakra boots are low, ending at or under the ankle bone, and they have only two or three, maximum of three eyelets. These end slightly above the ankle bone, and they have four eyelets plus one set of speed hooks. Apparently, according to my uh, Facebook boot enthusiast group friends, uh, these are more correctly called an ankle boot. What is an ankle boot? Oh dear God, let's not go there. Instead, let's take a look at how these boots are constructed. The uppers are full grain leather, uh, but looking at it closely, it's corrected grain, meaning the grain surface has been lightly sanded to remove imperfections uh, to make a perfectly smooth leather that's uniform and easy to handle in large-scale boot manufacture. This is a distressed leather. I think it's actually an oiled nubuck, oiled and waxed in the tanning. It has that soft, nappy feel of nubuck, but also feels quite waxy to the touch. You can feel the nappiness of the nubuck, but it is waxed down so that when you um, run your hands over it, the wax moves over the nap of the nubuck, creating that distressed look. It has a good feel in the hand, and it is soft and supple, but it's actually quite thin at one and a half mils. That's suede-like thickness. I've no idea what tannery or country the leather comes from. Timberlands say that they, um, I quote, source the majority of our hides from U.S. cattle that are raised for food and processed according to USDA guidelines. That's not the only source. They go on to say, additionally, we have banned the sourcing of the hides from certain countries or regions where we have learned of animal husbandry concerns. So some effort put into ethical sourcing anyway. That's a good thing. The leather is waterproof. It was advertised as a waterproof boot when I bought it. The tongue is the same leather, and it is gusseted right up to the fourth eyelet, um, but it's uh, got a canvas gusset. While the leather and the joint between the uppers and the sole may be waterproof, I'm not sure if this canvas gusset is a weak point or not. I haven't had wet feet in the rain though, uh, but I haven't waded through a river anyway. The hardware looks like brass, I'm not sure if they are, and they're all backed in order to protect the tongue, which is a good thing. I'm pretty sure the lasting, uh, that's when they stretch the uppers into shape of a, a last, as well as the stitching uh, is mass produced uh, uh, through a production line process. While handmade boots do necessarily mean that a person hand stitches the boot, it usually does mean that a human hand guides the boot through the sewing machine, and certainly a human being stretches the leather over the last and hammers it into shape. In this case, I reckon it's all production line with dozens of boots being mechanically stretched over a line of lasts and there's a computer-controlled sewing machine in there somewhere. As a result, the stitching is perfect. <laughs> Perfectly aligned stitches, no loose stitching, no wheel marks or uh, stuff-ups to be seen. Um, that's to be expected when machines make everything exactly the same. Although obviously, things do get screwed up from time to time and so I have to conclude that QC in Timberland is pretty good. The toe is unstructured, and despite the back stay, the heel is structured with a very thin piece of something, probably cardboard because it really feels soft. I say probably cardboard because there's quite a fair amount of synthetic material in this boot. It's fully lined with a cotton fabric lining, quite comfortable, but I find it can make my feet smell in hot weather. Unlike leather, cotton doesn't really wick sweat away. Now, uh, let's move on to the sole. Like the classic Timberland 6-inch Nubuck yellow boot, the sole is attached using thermally injected polyurethane. The uppers are stuck into a mould, and molten TPU is injected into the mould, and as it cools, it's stuck to the uh, uppers. This means totally not resolable. Once you wear the sole out, the boot's a throwaway. It's not an expensive boot after all, so I think this is perfectly acceptable because the leather is probably not going to last much longer than the sole. And if you get three or four or more years everyday wear out of it, your cost, cost per wear is um, pretty acceptable in my opinion. The uh, moulding of the sole creates a welt-like design, purely for aesthetic purposes with some moulded stitching involved. The upside is that this is totally waterproof because the direct in uh, injection of molten TPU creates a complete seal. Uh, the insole is just cardboard with a uh, canvas cover, uh, and Timberland gives you a padded foam removable footbed for comfort. The moulding of the uh, outsole creates a great grippy pattern. Uh, I don't know what you call this pattern, not quite lugs, uh, not a commander pattern like their classic six-inch six boot, 
more like a, what would you say, a crisscross of rosettes that form a good pattern that grips, uh, but also doesn't pick up gravel and dirt. Overall, as man-made as the materials are, the TPU sole and the foam footbed make for a pretty comfortable boot. Um, there's lots of shock absorption. Now let's take a look at sizing. I take a UK 7.5 true to size in an average width. That translates uh, in numbers to a US 8.5D. By true to size, I mean as measured on the Brannock device. Uh, the Brannock device is one of those things that you stand on in a shoe store. Uh, the salesperson will slide the sliders around to measure the length of your feet and the width of the ball of your feet. In heritage American boots like the Iron Ranger, the Higgins Mill and uh, Alden Indies, I take an 8D. That's the usual thing that they advise you to go down half a size. Timberland run large. These are an 8 wide. I tried an 8 standard in store. Uh, Timberland don't have B, C, D, E widths. They just have standard and wide. I tried an 8 standard in the store and it was just a bit too narrow. I tried a 7.5 wide and it was just a bit too short. So like my 6 inch classic Tims, the best size for me seems to be this 8 wide. It's okay. It is roomy. Uh, pretty roomy. <laughs> I've taken to using an orthotic insert to fill up the volume and also to give me a little more arch support because this thing does not have a shank. That's a piece of steel or plastic that runs across here supporting this gap. A shank gives the uh, heel foot structure rigidity. Without a shank, the pressure of your feet into the boot can cause the unsupported sole structure here to deform. Uh, in time over the day, this can give you very tired feet. The orthotics uh, with built-in arch support help. Once I found the fit, apart from needing the uh, add-on arch support, they're actually very comfortable. That's another advantage of this type of mass-produced boots uh, from a good manufacturer. They are designed to wear comfortably right out of the box. They don't have uh, uh, thick rugged leathers in the uppers. They don't have um, thick heel counters that uh, give you heel slip until they break in. Uh, they don't have multiple leather and cork soles that are stiff until they break in. So no breaking required because there's nothing to break in. Just like your Nikes or Reeboks which you don't break in, do you? Mind you, such a shoe from a bad manufacturer could be quite uncomfortable. Uh, if not out of the box, then over time as things start to break down. They wouldn't be as well designed around the foot and, and the way they're actually put together, you know, large seams, badly placed seams, that sort of thing, uh, could cause aches and pains in various parts of your feet as you wear them. I think overall, if you compare these to quality Goodyear welted or similarly well constructed boots, they probably only rate 4 or 5 out of 10 because of their materials and their construction method. But for comfort, oh gosh, I think I'd go as high as saying 8 out of 10. Turning to leather care now, uh, I don't actually think you need any. <laughs> uh, it's treated in such a way that I don't think you need to baby it. Um, it's a new buck that's waxy enough to stay reasonably moist. It's presented in a distressed state, so it doesn't need polishing. Uh, I think if you really did want to condition it, something like Smith's Leather Balm would work. Um, once, when I got uh, drenched and spatted in Black's Hall clay after a trip to the northwest of Oz, I did wash it off with water, hosed it basically, and then applied a smear of R.M. Williams saddle dressing. Worked up fine. That means what you can wear it with is also easy. It's a casual, no worries boot. So you can match it to any casual gear, jeans, not so dressy chinos, t-shirts, flannels, jeans and polos, that sort of thing. Uh, it's very much a Timberland aesthetic. Um, a lumberjack and I'm okay, it's that kind of vibe. Now this is where I usually talk about value, but I'm a little at a disadvantage because I cannot remember how much I bought it for in Singapore. What? Um, five or six years ago. I want to say that they were around 250 to 300 Singapore dollars, but I'm not sure. Probably more the $250 end. Most Timberland boots, apart from the classic six incher, sell for around that much in Singapore. Uh, and that's about the same in Australian dollars. It's about one for one and it translates to about 180 US dollars. I think though, looking at the US website, they probably sell for something less in the US at around $130. So anyway, let me talk about that subjective thing called value not from a monetary perspective, but from a use perspective. From what I've said about the construction of leather, maybe you're expecting me to say these are cheap boots and not worth it. Well, actually, I take all that lower quality production thing on board, and I actually like these boots for what they are. I really like the aesthetic, the slightly bulbous toe and the slight toe spring. 
uh, the chunky sole, the chunky yet slim shape, the distressed leather, uh, even the not chaka hut. I like the look of it. They are waterproof. I've worn them in heavy rain and muddy conditions. Uh, the sole is very grippy in muddy conditions and worse when you step off the mud onto wet, slippery uh, uh, brick paving. They're easy to clean and take care of. I hose them down basically. Uh, and they are, once you sort out the arch support, comfortable to wear and walk around in. What's their value as a knockabout boot to me? Not bad. Not something I'd reach for every day, but when I do, I feel comfortable and safe. I'd give it at least a 7 or 8 out of 10. Okay, so that's it. My opinion of the Timberland may be chuckers. Uh, that's maybe something in the Redwood Falls range of boots. I'd love it if someone could actually tell me what this is called. Maybe someone from Singapore. Anyway, I have loads more boot reviews and unboxings to unload. So if you like this video, I hope you show it by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons below. If you do subscribe, YouTube will also tell you when I upload my videos, so if you like to watch videos about boots, well, you're sorted. <laughs> so stay tuned, and I'll see you soon.